Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session on conservation science. Uh, I'm David Douglas from the RSTV, based in Edinburgh, and I'm chairing this afternoon. Uh, we'll go straight to our first speaker, who's Natalie Petarelli, and she's going to talk to us about ultrasonic monitoring, forest conversion, and that percentage. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> I can see this is a difficult slot. 
after yesterday evening, after two days of a conference, I'm really appreciative and grateful that you made the, the, the effort to actually come and hear about forests and bats, which I'm sure if, if you know anything about what I do, you would have not expected. <laughs> so this come out because um, a PhD of mine finished a PhD now two years ago, and this is something that we got out and published this year, and I thought it would be a great opportunity to talk about this at this conference. Um, now, you may think that there's way too much research on forests and tropical forests and what could we possibly learn that we don't know already, uh, given the high conservation attention that has been given to those uh, ecosystems. Well, it turns out that we don't really know much about land use change and how that can actually affect how diversity, biodiversity, uh, responds to it. In particular, we don't really know what is an acceptable level of change. Do we just need to maintain those pristine forests? Can we do a bit of logging? Can we do just some conversion here and there? What can we do and what can't we do? And how does biodiversity respond to that? Uh, whether it's species composition, ecosystem functioning, etc. cetera. Um, so this is the purpose of this study, which was to look at uh, change and how biodiversity fare along a gradient of land use change. And what's interesting interesting is that it was done in one of the most remote, unstudied, yes, biodiversity hotspot in the world, and that's the Solomon Island. Um, you may wonder where it was. Uh, definitely, I learned that when my PhD students started to work there. This is here, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, and it's just here. And we focused on one particular island, which is the Makira Island. And in that island, in a particular, uh, partic uh, particular area, which is uh, the south, East. Uh, why is it interesting, uh, apart from the fact that it's a biodiversity hotspot? It's actually a, a really fascinating um, environment in terms of transition. So it is one of the last remaining uh, tract of undisturbed tropical forest on an island. Uh, but uh, population, human population growth is, 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 is completely exploding. It's 3.5 percent annually. At the same time, there's a change in how society works, and more and more it's a monetary system, which means that how people relate to resource and use resource is changing dramatically too. Uh, within those uh, type of ecosystem, you really find typically four type of um, land use. You have the area where no one goes, mostly because um, the, the slopes and the variation in altitude can be quite dramatic. And so you have still some pristine area. Then you have some second tree forest, which is non-continuous canopy. There's a bit of logging, uh, but it, it's relatively low intensity. Then you get something that's called the garden, uh, where it's basically the, the traditional way people were using um, the land to produce food without going into the drastic force case, which is monoculture. And that has becoming, it is becoming more and more uh, common over there as people are trying to, do, to grow cash crops to make money to then buy food instead of growing the food that they will then eat in the gardens. And so what we did here was to try to look at how biodiversity respond to those different levels. And we focused on bats. Now you might wonder why bats. First of all, it's a mammal, but <laughs> uh, it's actually a really common species, uh, a really common mammal in South Pacific. It's actually 64% 64, 64 of the terrestrial mammal you find in, in the South Pacific are actually bats. It's quite diverse in terms of diet, morphology, genius, phylogeny, and also provide key ecosystem services for the people over there, which is pollination, getting rid of pests, etc., cetera, et cetera. It's also a group that has been shown to be sensitive to human-induced changes, and also a group where we had slightly more information than, let's say, some of the insects um, or, uh, or other groups, uh, reptiles, amphibians, and that are really largely undescribed or unknown uh, for that part uh, of the world. So we decided to test two hypotheses. The first one was that uh, there would be some form of correlation um, between uh, bats distribution and uh, changes in land use. In particular, we really thought that things would go wrong in monoculture and that gardens might exhibit some kind of intermediate level of uh, bat activity, but things should go well in an uh, intact and secondary forest. That was the hypothesis we went for. The second one was, uh, had to do with morphological traits. So the fact that as you change the 3D structure of the habitat, well, ha the type of bats that fare well in those environments might change. So if you are uh, uh, 
uh, foraging in more uh, open habitat, you can afford to have those long winds and do some complicated uh, uh, maneuver. But, uh, but if you are in a, in a much more diverse really environment, you really need the flexibility and the adaptability to, do, um, uh, to change uh, quickly direction. And so there should be some relationship with uh, wing uh, morphology, wing length. So how, how do you actually practically get on about doing this? Um, if you are to want to monitor bats uh, using uh, acoustics, so a non-invasive way, you actually need to know, uh, what, to, to be able to identify the calls that you're going to record, which means that you need a library, uh, which means that we had to uh, actually captures, capture uh, bats in the wild, then uh, try to measure them to make sure that we have some right uh, information about their wing morphology, but most importantly to capture information about their call, to use that as a library to then monitor change in activity along our gradient of land use. And so we did so uh, uh, over several nights and, and way before the um, uh, recording. The second phase was then to do some ultra monitoring, ultra sonic monitoring uh, in the gradient of land use. And so we did that from February to July 2012 using a fixed location and ultrasonic recorders. I put the, the marks just in case someone is already doing that and was wondering what kind of technology we were using. Um, it was attached to a tree with the microphone pointing slightly down to protect from the rain. At least that, given that it had never been done in those environments and never tested and trial, we had no idea about how many you would need, how would you need to place them, etc., etc. So my last slide is actually about telling you what we learned uh, in terms of if you want to do something like this. <laughs> the detector were also positioned so at different sites for a long night and in different type of habitats. So what did we find? The first thing that we find is that there are some differences uh, in terms of bat activity. So that's the mean bat passes per night in forest, secondary, garden, and monoculture. And as you can see, it's quite low in monoculture, also quite low in primary forest, which wasn't expected, and then quite uh, slightly higher in those two secondary and garden. But what's really important here is to look at the variability. There is huge variability. And when you look whether there's a significant difference or not, there's actually none. So no significant difference between the habitat in terms of bat activity between those four different habitats. In terms of what species we managed to record, out of the 10 possible echolocating bats in Makira, we did manage to uh, capture the calls of five of them. Uh, with uh, this one, Hipocera demisus, which is uh, actually a vulnerable species uh, endemic to Makira. So as you can see, uh, quite some differences in the number of samples where they were fine. And here are the, the, the forearm lengths and wing lengths that we managed if we, uh, to measure. If we go into trying to look at uh, how that distributes along the four types of habitat, and uh, this species, Australis, was actually fine everywhere, uh, but that vulnerable one was only found in secondary forests. As you can see, the number of passes, which is uh, uh, the same, with some similar information as before, uh, varied a lot with uh, higher in um, secondary forest and uh, garden. What's interesting is that we did find some information or some level of correlation between wing morphology and those type of uh, land use with an increase in the length of the species found uh, in the different um, land use type as the anthropogenic pressure actually increased. So the highest mean was in uh, those monoculture, while the lowest mean was in the, um, a primary forest, and that was significant. However, uh, we didn't find at all any significant relationship with the mean wing length. So very, very low support to our hypothesis in general. Does it mean that we had the hypothesis wrong? Might well be. But actually what I think is that uh, this study provides a really good study case of how to start something in an area where nothing has been done and no one actually knows how to do it. Um, so if ever you want to consider doing some bioacoustics in tropical forests in an environment where it rains heavily a lot, uh, and you can't really predict uh, what's going to happen in terms of uh, your monitoring. Here are some uh, little 
um, lessons that we learn. First one, think about your uh, detector placement. It's, it's incredible how much variability we had between the different detector. And uh, there is a trade-off between representativity but, and detectability, but clearly that was a major issue to try to explain some of our variation. You need to bear in mind that there can be theft, that there can be damage, that there can be uh, some anthropogenic disturbance that will just fuck up the wall monitoring uh, for that night in that place. <laughs> and we didn't have too much theft problem because of the culture and the area, but we definitely had some problem with rain, heavy rain. And we tried not to do it when we knew it was heavily raining, but sometimes we just got caught by the weather. Powering the detector can be quite have access to easily to batteries. Um, and so the supply can be quite demanding in terms of uh, uh, having enough given the number of nights that you want to do, etc. We clearly didn't do enough night. Uh, we could have done more, but we saw that this could work anyway. Learn a lot. Data storage was also something to try to come and collect and have enough on you because there's no access to internet, so you don't do online storage. You have to do physical storage and you have to make copies just that you don't lose your, your data, etc. Et Finally, the core library availability was really something uh, determining, the, uh, the key. Uh, trying to find someone that actually can build a library of call that is representative of call in the world is something that really influenced our ability to analyze those data. And I'm going to stop there. If ever you want to uh, learn more about this, it's actually open access. So please go and uh, have a look at uh, this in remote sensing and ecology and conservation. You can also go on question. Tammy is the first author, and she's back in the UK. So don't hesitate to email her or tweet her. And you can also drop me an email for qu any question. Thank you very much. I was just wondering, uh, what height did you have your microphones mounted on the, in the forest? Chest, more or less, a meter, a meter and twenty. This could be a problem in the forest. I, I also work in forest habitats with bats. Yeah. I mean, it, potentially you're missing the things that are flying a little bit higher. So yeah, yeah, no, she was. But the, the wall tragedy was that it was extremely difficult to rain, so they couldn't really have anything to... They, they, uh, uh, there's probably a good point <laughs> we could have tried to. Uh, but that's... Um, that, that's access uh, to the right point and knowing where to go was really something, possibly. Yeah. It's a yeah. good point to pass it to her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, when you're analysing your back calls, do you use... Um, uh, sorry, do you use software or do you do it by hand? Sort of no, no, it's, uh, so it's actually quite, quite a tricky analysis where you have to look for probability. So you determine threshold under which you say that the probability is likely the same as to be as your reference call, so you end up with matrix of confusion, etc. Um, so it's all done uh, technically, and there's, there's some free software to use, uh, but it's, it's, it's actually took us quite a while to get that to work well. So no, no, not by hand. What you do by hand is to determine where the call is. So as soon as you have the change in frequency, you identify that as a call, and then you put it for classification. Yeah. One final question. Um, I don't know much about the bat, but the bats have, the bats have dialects. So then if your reference call is coming from somewhere else, could that be kind of maybe... Oh, no, no, they were done in Makira. So oh, the okay. trapping was done in Makira. Oh, I don't know about dialect either. <laughs> But I think in that case it wasn't a problem because the trapping was actually done in Makura. Some of them were endemic, so, uh, and it sh the, the region is relatively small, so it could have been a problem, but I don't think so. It's less likely than other problems, such as the tree of the, the height of the tree. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. So, anybody that's ever been brave or possibly foolish enough to try and assemble flat pack furniture might have a bit of a grudge against timbers. But they are, in fact, incredibly valuable to us. Um, they provide a multitude of ecosystem services. The World Bank estimates that 
um, per annum, they contribute 500 billion US dollars to global GDP. Um, they're responsible for uh, hundreds, of lively, uh, hundreds of millions of livelihoods around the world. Um, many of them are dominant species in their ecosystems, such as the uh, Dipterocarpaceae, um, and fulfill a massive um, ecosystem roles. So, it may seem straightforward to ask what is a timber tree species, but in fact, I found out that it isn't so easy. Um, most, most timbers are traded under a common name, which can encompass um, tens of species. So, to start with, I looked through the literature, I looked through um, online um, trade databases to see what is traded at the moment, and I found over 1,500 families um, the legumes, diptrocups, and sapotaceae dominated. Um, so this is an awful lot of species in trade. So because they're commercial species, it's often assumed that they'll, their conservation status is absolutely fine because we use them regularly, therefore we must be sustainably using them. Um, this isn't often the case. Um, many of timber species are wild harvested, so they're still um, affected by things like unsustainable logging, illegal logging, and deforestation, which obviously is a crisis at the moment. So um, this work goes towards the policy targets of the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, which aims to assess all um, extinction risk by the year 2020. And because we have limited conservation resources, it's really key to prioritize which species to, um, to concentrate on. So to do this, I use the IUCN Red List as a quantitative tool to assess extinction risk. Um, and the Red List has um, numerous categories, three of which are threatened, critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. And these are the species which are prioritized for conservation um, intervention. Um, so it's, uh, it's based on five criteria. Criterion A, population reduction over a time span that is appropriate to the taxon. So that could be three generations or 10 years, whichever is the longer. Criterion B, which is often used for plants, as we, we typically have little information on population, is about the size of the species range and whether or not there's been a reduction in suitable habitat. Criteria C and D are about small populations, again, not an awful lot of information for plants typically, and E is a PVA. So what's been done for timbers in the past? Well, the World List of Threatened Trees, uh, which was an enormous publication in 1998 did touch on timbers. There were around 700 um, plant species that were listed as threatened. Um, some of them were timbers. However, most of this relied on expert knowledge. There was no mapping done, and the assessments were not particularly quantitative. So now, with um, huge digitized uh, global records databases, such as GBIF, the Global Divers uh, Biodiversity Information Facility, uh, high resolution satellite imagery, we can actually, we have a great opportunity to properly assess these timbers. So I started with uh, species occurrence records downloaded from GBIF. Um, I then cleaned them by removing erroneous coordinates, doing taxonomic checks to check for synonymy or just plain wrong <laughs> names. Um, and then I overlaid this with um, known native range countries for these species from published floras. So the red list only looks at species in their native environment, so I wasn't interested in anything that had been planted somewhere else. Then the next thing to do with plants typically is to apply criterion B. So criterion B has two components, the extent of occurrence, which is often mistaken for the species range, but in fact um, uh, is a minimum convex polygon around the, um, all known occurrences of the species, and it's uh, looking at the spread of threat around that range. So it may encompass areas which are not suitable habitat, but it's all about how threats could move around. And the threshold for a threatened species on um, EOO is to, uh, 20,000 kilometers squared. Next is the area of occupancy, which is often done by overlaying a grid, um, typically four kilometers squared, onto the species occurrence records and to look at occupancy. Another way to do this is to look at suitable habitat. So when I did this, um, I used the, the EOO measure, and I, I narrowed my species set down from 1,500 plus to 332 species, which were either range-restricted or had been assessed in the past as threatened or near-threatened. So I found that um, they're clumped in West Africa, in Southeast Asia, 
um, Central America and South America. Okay, so these um, give you a little bit of an idea about the spread of uh, extent of occurrence. So some of these species are pretty restricted and others are just enormously widespread. Now, 74 species had less than three records, which means I couldn't draw a convex polygon, so uh, those were data deficient. Um, I didn't use the grid square method of calculating AOA because I felt that it wasn't suitable, seeing as we had such large variation in records for these species from less than three to over 5,000. So instead, I looked at suitable habitat using the Global Forest Change data set from Matthew Hansen and colleagues, which is a um, 30 meter resolution. It's near global scale. There are some areas in uh, Oceania which aren't completely covered. And it looks at tree cover, where trees are defined as um, habitat over five meters in height um, at the pixel scale. It looks at gross loss over 14 years from the year 2000 to 2014. Uh, so I then downloaded these data for my species ranges and uh, can carry out spatial analysis in ArcMap. So to calculate maximum AOO, in other words, suitable habitat for the species, um, and that would be tree cover, I also wanted to work out sort of habitat quality. So rather than just say anything that was a tree was forest, I wanted to set a limit. So I had 30% canopy cover at the pixel scale to, to um, delineate forest from non-forest. Um, and you can see on the map here, this is a typical EOO, extent of occurrence, for um, Coprophera salicoida. Um, and then when we look within the range, we can see that this is the spread of um, suitable habitat for the species broadly. So 30% uh, canopy cover, this is the spread of forest. Uh, I then wanted to remove anything that was unsuitable. So unfortunately, uh, satellite imagery this, this data set does not differentiate between plantations such as oil palm and uh, native forest. So um, I had some records from the Global Forest Watch for unfortunately only eight countries, but it did give me some idea of where there might be oil palm plantations and wood fiber plantations. So in this uh, picture you can see Cameroon. Um, and then when we overlay a species we can see that uh, it's a, quite a large amount of the uh, species AOO is taken up with plantations, so I wanted to remove those um, because I didn't think the species would occur there. So then I looked at deforestation um, for the 14-year period, um, and I just summed a number of pixels showing forest loss. I assumed no natural regeneration because um, most of the data is uh, gross and it's quite difficult to, to um, decide what would be natural regeneration and what would potentially be a plantation that's been established. So you can see the purple in this species is where um, there's been forest loss over the 14-year period. So we've already applied criterion B, but what about criterion A? Well, we want to know uh, population declines within, um, within the species range over time period typical to the taxon. So I'd say 50 years as a general rule for a generation length estimate for a, for a long living tree. We assume a constant rate of loss. Now, instead of population decline, which is quite difficult to, to know without some density assessments, I'm using um, AOO as a proxy for population decline. Obviously, there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship, but we can get a pretty good idea of what's going on. So here you're looking at the, uh, the red box at the bottom for um, future projected reductions. So the thresholds for critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. So when I applied this, um, I found that most species were least concern. However, there are substantial amounts that are in threatened categories or near threatened, which need to be looked at. Um, the data deficient species are the ones for which there were fewer than three records, and I couldn't um, carry out the assessment. Now, in the past, uh, in the 1998 assessments, this is typically what was given as, um, as an assessment. So uh, it looks like everything is really, really in trouble. But uh, when I look at my assessments, I can see that probably isn't the case. Now, I was stressed that um, my assessments don't take into account population size. They, um, they're just looking at forest cover. So this is sort of potentially I'm missing a few things. So what I'd like to do next is use some trade data to see whether or not we can um, ensure that I've done a full assessment. But take home messages. There are timber species, even though commercial, that are threatened with extinction. 
Um, the red list is a tool that we can use for plants, even widespread plants, and satellite imagery is an incredible boon to this process. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank my supervisors and everybody who's helped me. And um, any questions? Yes, I hope so. So um, the red list is flexible to uncertainty. So we know that we're not going to be able to go and ground truth every single species. But the way the categories are spread, it is possible to inform conservation assessments. Yes, I hope so. Thanks very much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, my question is, uh, if if you don't have data for the abundance of some of these species, and given that they're tropical species, and, and in the tropics, a of, at least a lot of them were tropical species, uh, in the tropics you've got really low uh, frequency of occurrence for some of these species, then how do you kind of uh, uh, account for that? That's a really good. Ranking? That's a really good question, and it is a known problem when assessing tree species, especially in the tropics, because we, we just don't have the data. But um, I'm hoping to use some species that have been listed on CITES because uh, typically these do have slightly better data. There's forest plots, there are some national inventories, and I'll try to extrapolate from those. But um, any ideas that you have, I'd be very pleased to hear them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, so it's, this is the only one that's a PDF, so it's already loaded up there. Shall I get to it? Yeah, well, it's... Hmm. So it's already loaded up there. I just need to bring it up so it can just it. Good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, so uh, my name is Hungarian and uh, I'm from Transylvania and I will present some um, phase of our grasslands which were um, abandoned. The ribolands became grasslands and then shrublands, increased shrublands and in the last five years they were cleared in a large part. Uh, so we know that the disturbance has a huge role in the shaping of the communities and some populations because of local disturbances may uh, go extinct and other uh, may persist which have larger tolerances 
and even these disturbance events may evidentiate interspecific interactions like um, competition between species. Uh, in Eastern Europe and in the majority of the states like uh, Poland, uh, Slovenia, Slovakia, and uh, Romania, Bulgaria, in the late 80s and uh, early 90s there were socio-economic changes, political changes, and this caused that a large part of the rebel land which were used before um, by the state was given back to their owners. And because their owners had uh, no tools with which they can work their lands, they were abandoned. And to 20 years, around 20 years, these were uh, just going to the uh, succession phases. And um, with the time, uh, there appeared the early uh, successional shrublands which became encroached. And uh, this uh, altered uh, the grassland habitats and these became mostly pastures with the time. Uh, it is interesting that with uh, the, so there is a review of Eldridge from 2011 in which they have found uh, from plenty of papers that the shrub increment changes the diversities of vertebrates and like birds and, and the insects, arthropods. Um, but if we look at uh, abundances, then we will see changes surely, and these changes occur slowly. So uh, the encroachment is uh, considered harmful and uh, mainly for the land managers and uh, because of the aggravation of the uh, management problems regarding livestock and the suppressions of productivity. Um, so these shrub removals may be implemented and they were implemented on large areas and on these areas these clearings, clear cuttings of shrublands will occur um, in the same time usually and this is, is a way to, to ameliorate these problems which uh, are caused by the shrublands. Um, so this, from my point of view, it was considered like, like a, a disturbance event. And uh, since we have found papers in which it was related that the, the encroachment causes changes in the abundances and even um, in, in other characteristics of the ant communities, um, we just try to, to see if their removal will be, so will have the same effect, so it, it should have effect. And also we have found that uh, shrub removal to the bird predation had a huge impact, impact on, the, um, on the diversity and the abundances of insects. And we chose to analyze these problems, these shrublands, which were cleared. Uh, and we began with two years before the clearings, um, the data collect things, and we, we chose two herbivore species which occur on these um, shrubs. So, um, so we wanted to quantify the effect of the shrub removal on the uh, insect herbivores, arthropods, and we asked if these clear cuttings or clearings uh, affect the abundances and the colonization of these species and if these effects are differentiated for the species. So for this, we used the most abundant species from our shrublands we have in Transylvania. And these are wild roses, uh, mostly Rosa carina, the dog rose. And it has a few uh, gall inducers like Diplopis uh, rose and Myri and some other. But the two most fragment are these two uh, species like Myri and Rosa, and I guess the the first one is, is quite frequent all Europe. The second one is a little bit souter. Uh, it, it has its area in souter. So um, the two goals are uh, quite different from the external uh, structure. One is spiny, the other is more hairy. Uh, both are multilocular, so they have, a ma they have many chambers and in the just a uh, uh, lot of gall inducers uh, are um, growing and uh, even take 
taking the internal structure, their wall thicknesses, the chamber wall thicknesses are different. So uh, there are differences even in the structure of the, the species of, of the goals. And uh, considering their uh, occurrence in these places, one of them is quite abundant. You can find it everywhere when, where roses appear. And they have a quite large variance. You, there are patches where you can find only a few, and there are patches where they are with hundreds. And the other species, the Myri, is like scarce and rare. Uh, usually, you, you don't find it. And when you find it, you can find it only in low numbers. So um, we, we used uh, six quadrates of one hectare. And we recorded all the rose shrubs from these quadrates. From these, in 2012, were cut two. So they were, uh, there were affected clearings. And in 2013, um, there was the third in which they affected the clearings. And um, so we, we measured like um, 1,300 uh, rose bushes. And we collected around. 1,500 uh, goals, and these were the patterns of the roses before the clearings, and from these three were treated, cleared, and other three were as control. So in 2012, 11, we collected the goals produced in 2010, and so on. In every year, the goals produced in, before, uh, in the year before. And in 2012, from the six quadrates, two were cleared, and 2013, again, two, one quadrate was cleared. And so we analyzed what, we, what I will present now, uh, data as after the clearings and the results. Um, so we used Gaussian and uh, Poisson GLMs. Um, GLMMs and the uh, outcome variables were the numbers of the bushes and the height of the bushes because they grew very fast after the clearings even. And uh, we used uh, the treatment as a fixed effect and the years to see if with the uh, years there is uh, changes occurring in the numbers of the goals. So uh, the outcome variables were also the number of, of the goals belonging to the two species. Uh, so we usually collect goals thank you. Uh, in February. Um, and the upper left picture is what we see. There are a lot of rose shrubs. And after the clearings, they are gathered in huge stocks. And we can even uh, collect the goals which were produced before. And after a few years, what we we're seeing it's there are a few rose bushes, but they grew up. So uh, they remain not clear totally. They regain somehow, but they were more or less. So this is the first result where we have found that it is normal that after the clear cuttings, the number of roses uh, was going down on the treated patches. But we can see that it. Uh, it, they were, they, they could not be cleared totally. So they regained somehow. Uh, what uh, regards their height, uh, we also see that there was a significant dif difference between the, the treatment and the control. But almost the half height they regained in, in this uh, three years period. So they are growing really fast. So if uh, the aim is to clear these, these pastures from the shops, then this clearing must be repeated a lot of times. Uh, considering the one of the uh, gall inducers, their number decreased with the time. So this is the the abundant one. So if the number of roses decreases, then it will actually it's normal decrease their number. What was more interesting that the not the species. However, we have seen that their number decreased, but it was, wasn't a significant decrease. So there was, uh, was not a significant difference between the, the clearings and the, treat, the control parts. And again, when we looked at the colonization, so these were calculated as we, 
we saw uh, how was the colonization before the treatment. Uh, from the no um, moment, how many goals appear to the next year, and then when they were cleared, then we just uh, took uh, the appeared number of goals and um, correlated with what was before. So we have seen that we, there were huge uh, drops in the colonizations of the both species. Okay, so uh, the clear cuttings were effective because the, the shrub uh, number decreased or the bush number decreased, but they regrew uh, very rapidly. Uh, the both species were affected, but the Myri, um, it seems that is less affected, and we were thinking about what, what is the, the reason why it, it may be more consistent in these places. It seems that it is a uh, earlier colonizator, and oh, uh, sorry, and it appears um, in the early stages when there are a lot of small shrubs, and after they grew, uh, there the the other species take its place. So usually, uh, in older shrublands, we we find the Dipelopis rosea as more abundant and the Myri as less abundant. Uh, it is interesting because uh, it seems that these clear cuttings in, in a really slow manner affect uh, the abundances. This will lead to their um, um, disappearance, but it is also have effects on their natural enemies and we have the data sets from the Gauss and the next step is to see how it affects the parasitoids which were emerging, emerging from the Gauss. And and thank you. That was all. Thanks. I have uh, time for any questions. Okay, so I have one. So, uh, did you look at how variation in the size of the clear cuts impacted on your results, and also how well connected they are? Do you think that could be important? So it, it was quite localized. So those places were, I don't know why, but these were which were cut. But the surroundings in those years were not uh, cleared. So we just picked before two years those places which were uh, later cleared. Um, from since that time, uh, the clearings just were uh, growing. And, and we can now see what happens if it is larger and larger. But actually, there had uh, places from where they can recolonize those patches. Any other questions? <coughs> okay, thanks, Lively. Okay, so next week is John Abernethy, who's going to be talking about uh, influence of forest structure on nest ecology of smart and orangutan. Thanks very much. Um, great to be here as well. Actually, so many people have turned up uh, after the party and after last night. Um, so yeah, I'm John Thi. I'm from John Moores University here in Liverpool. Uh, just come back a couple of months ago from Indonesia. So a lot of these results are pretty new. Some of them I've even got the past week, so they're a bit rough and ready. Uh, but yeah, let's take you through what I've found and what I've seen so far. Um, I'm not going to try and... Uh, so sort of patronise you, I imagine most would know what orangutans are, largest arboreal species uh, found. We have two species, well, two species, but they're sort of going to possibly uh, introduce a third one now um, with some genetic data from Batang Toro in uh, South Sumatra. Um, but there's also, both now have been also listed as critically endangered as of this year, and Sumatran, the numbers have changed, but that's not 
saying they're less endangered, it's just we've got better survey techniques to actually find them. Uh, which my supervisor and a bunch of the people I work with uh, published that earlier in May this year. Um, biggest problem, all uh, the ranks, as I imagine most of you know, is the oil palm plantations and pet trade and general just deforestation at the moment. So where am I actually working? Oh, wait, sorry, I'm completely ahead of myself. Um, so what am I actually looking at with the orangutans? So at the moment, this is just talking about my first chapter, which I'm looking at nests. Um, why am I even looking at nests? So with orangutans, even though they're quite a large animal, and when they're moving, they're really, really noisy, and you'd think for an animal that weighs more than me and is bright red fur, they're straggly and kind of noisy at night, they're pretty, you'd think they'd be easy to find, but unfortunately an animal that doesn't move very much and at the top of a tree is pretty hard to see and unfortunately 80% of their day is spent resting in their nests. So if they're going to spend 80% of their day there and they have to build these daily then they've got to be quite important to their ecology and people really haven't looked into them. Uh, I think people just generally assume that it's a generalist they'll make them anywhere they can. Um, but when you actually look at the sort of complex nature of the nest, of how to build it and what they're looking at. And especially the fact that even if you take a young orangutan in captivity and you put it just with a bunch of, you know, the sort of branches, they'll try to build a nest. It'll be a terrible nest, but they will actually try to make something. So where I'm working is uh, in Gunung Loser National Park. Uh, it's a part of the greater loser ecosystem. Um, I had no idea where it was before I started this project. Um, unfortunately, luckily now, actually, a lot of people started to realise where it is, uh, thanks to Leonardo DiCaprio and his random one-day trip there this year. It was great, he just sort of turned up, shook a bunch of hands, went on a boat and then went back in a helicopter. Yeah, it's great for uh, sort of talking about green stuff and using things responsibly. But anyway, so why is it important? It's um, the only place left on Earth where we actually have rhinos, elephants, tigers and orangutans occurring naturally. Uh, it is huge. It's the size of Bali. Um, it's 2.6 million hectares. Uh, huge diversity, as you can see. Uh, I think it makes up about 45% of all recorded. Um, but the big problem at the moment, uh, especially if you've been paying attention to conservation news, is the HA spatial plan. So basically, the Achenese government have sort of allocated all the land across Ache and have decided that 1.2 million hectares of this should now be opened up for mining, green energy, palm oil, uh, agriculture, and just anything else. So this is why needing a bit more research going on here and actually trying to raise a bit more awareness of the conservation needs for, for well, just for people, just so people know about Loser. And just to show about the diversity, this is some of the stuff I recorded from a, a separate camera chat project that I ran when I was there. Um, this was only over three months. We got smart uh, tigers twice, sun bears, yellow throat martins, Cloud, uh, marble cat, uh, leopard cat, munjack. We, called, we recorded about seven cat species, total about 13 carnivals. It's ridiculous what there is actually there, even though you won't see almost anything other than a pig, maybe, when, if you're really lucky. Um, so specifically, where am I working? I'm working at two, I've been working mostly at one field site, and I was lucky enough to visit another one this year. Uh, they're on the eastern edge of, Luz, of Gunung Loser in uh, North Sumatra. So one is run by the Smart Orangutan Conservation Program, which is Secundur, and the other one is run by the Orangutan Information Centre, uh, known as Sebetul. Um, Secundur was hev selectively logged, but heavily selectively logged 30 years ago, but has, since then has been allowed to completely recover. Um, it is different in some places. It's still sort of, you can see that everything is of a similar age, kind of looks more plantation, whereas other areas you actually do still have the, f the 50 metre tall trees. Whereas, uh, say, Betong was, up to 15 years ago, was a complete oil palm plantation. Uh, luckily, they got a bit of money, um, cut all the oil palm down, poisoned them, and then started replanting. This is a very, very different forest, though, when I actually got to go there. Um, so I decided to sort of compare what the, the situation is too, especially now where we're trying to improve the forest quality in a lot of these areas. So reforestation is quite an important thing to understand how the orangutans cope with this. So research questions I've just decided to try to answer at first with, with the basic stuff I've got. So does the tree architecture actually affect nest tree selection? 
Like, and after that, do orangutans actually prefer to build in certain kinds of tree, or is it just as generalist and plastic as most people just like to make out? Um, are they actually affected by canopy density and gap uh, frequency, which, of course, once, when we are selectively logging or when we are removing trees, this is going to become more important. And does the actual forest condition itself, so go relating to the actual gaps and uh, canopy density, does this actually affect what their choices are? Do they still carry on the same preferences or they just sort of make do when, with what they can uh, find? So simple thing to answer is what is forest structure? Uh, I've just got, there's multiple definitions you can look it up. I went for a very simple one from uh, the US Forestry Commission, which was the horizontal and vertical distribution of layers in the forest, including trees, shrubs, and ground cover. Um, I'm sure many of you remember from your undergrads of looking at the uh, sort of layers of canopy and forest structure. That's just a very simple idea of it, and that's just the, the basic approach I sort of took. And just the way I then took it was to try to look at forest structure as a three-dimensional environment, because the orangutans, unlike most of the animals, are going to be used as use just a two-dimensional environment of going forwards and backwards, side to side. The orangutans can also go move up and diagonally in every other direction. So we really do need to understand how, what affects how they move through it, as well as where they build a nest, where they choose to place themselves amongst that environment. As a simple basic thing, just to, uh, when I was planning out in Secunda, um, just to have a look for a difference of forest types, because it's very difficult when you walk into the forest and go, this one looks like a hill forest, this one looks like a uh, alluvial. Um, we just sort of used the, full, uh, the data on soil types underneath and then set the translates around that as a sort of proxy. It actually didn't work out. Um, so the methodology was just, I carried out a number of uh, translates 500 meters long in Segunda and annoyingly in OIC they were a kilometer long because I was using some pre-existing translates because I didn't want to cut, uh, cut any more trails through the forest. Um, I was using the PCQM uh, method, so that's just points and a quarter. Uh, it's very good for when you actually want to get a density, uh, so tree density afterwards. I haven't had a chance to run that number yet. Um, and a number of things I was recording then for each tree was tree height, height first bowl, the canopy depth, so that's just the difference between the two, uh, canopy, shape, so canopy shape, so I came up with a sort of basic six shapes of a crown for a tree, um, which is your spheroid, elongated spheroid, umbrellas, cones, upside down cones, and a bent over, which that was just the weird one you noticed when you're there. Um, and just, oh, it's disappeared. Yeah, so canopy overlap and canopy density is what I've, I've managed to get those from using canopy photography. So that's where I've utilized uh, two different lenses, so a 35 mil and a, and a fisheye lens, and then using so, uh, two different software. So canopy digi, which is a free software available to download, and hemisphere, which is a paid for one, but I haven't started with the hemisphere yet, Campy Digi, yeah, it's free, but there's a reason why it's free. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I was originally planning on telling people, oh, this is a great one, NGOs can afford it. And yeah, you'll afford it, but then you'll spend a long time actually processing. So nest is very similar, but then I also include nest height, age, position, and tree species. So what do we find? So in Secunda, I got 120 nests. And 1,200 trees, something like 4,000 canopy photos. That's a lot of data. Uh, with OIC, it was only 45 nests, and 38 of those were clustered on one transect. And every single one of those 38 were found within five meters of an abandoned oil palm plant, which, yeah, it's a little bit worrying when that's the only real sort of thing that explains where they're there. And especially when you know, we're trying to not have them going into the oil palm, especially when you can see on the map that. Uh, OIC is basically surrounded on all three, well, on three sides by oil palm plantation. Um, and then when they start associating with an oil palm, then there may be conflict. And especially that we also get them in den higher densities there together, that there could also be more conflict and disease transmission between them. So let's look at a quick bit with heights. So what we did see is that they are, there is a statistical difference between, uh, between the height of what is available and what they're actually using in both sites. So in uh, Secunda, they are choosing to use larger, but not the absolute largest available. And same in OIC, but they're just a bit smaller. Uh, what we can see is it actually does sort of bring this almost like a normal distribution, like a nice bell curve is what the orangutans are using, compared to the actual availability is very much skewed to the left. And when we look at Jacob's D, so we look at the actual preference, uh, so that's basically how much they're using something in relation to its availability in the environment. Uh, they're heavily selecting uh, in Secunda for the 21 to 25 range, 
but then they're uh, highly avoiding the, low, the smallest uh, sort of sizes that are available. But in OIC, it's a bit weird because I've got such small data. The only, it's only really the sort of three middle ones that I can really use. I need to use a bon, uh, Bonferroni confidence intervals to actually be sure which ones I can use properly. And when we look at CBH, so that's just the stem diameter. It's the same trend. It looks absolutely identical. Just that we don't, I don't have that small size graph because I was only recording the ones with 30 centimeter uh, circumference and above. Um, and again, they're choosing, they're avoiding the smallest, avoiding the sort of largest ones and going for the sort of middle range. But what we do see is that in the reforested site, they're not as picky as they are in a more uh, sort of pristine environment or the recovered one. I tried to do a species. I'm waiting at the moment for one of the guys in Smarter to give me the actual scientific names because at the moment I'm stuck with local names. Uh, what I did find when I sort of pulled them into uh, sort of groups of the same family, that about 52% of all the nests are within eight, eight sort of genera, and all of these were fruiting species or food uh, supplying species. So there does seem to be a selection for those that provide food. And I looked at uh, connectivity, so how much the tree overlaps with another one. Um, in Secunda, there is a, uh, they generally are avoiding these less connected, but in IC, there is nothing really of a high significance. And the one that's avoiding the highest is actually probably just due to uh, the skew from one transate, which had no orangutan nest on, but was all much taller trees. Uh, so that's kind of pulled that there, which I need to find a way to alter. So crown shape and position. Uh, so this is a bit of the confusing one. So what I want to see is, does the shape of the tree affect where they are? Cool. Uh, which ones they choose and where they position. Um, so there is, does, there is a high significance for choosing speci uh, specific shapes of the, cr of the crown. And we can see that there is, the, uh, at least in Secunda, they are uh, highly preferring the cone-shaped ones, but they're using the S-shape almost exactly as they are available in the environment, which was about 69% of all of them. Then what I tried to do was actually look at the, uh, the relationship of if the crown affects where they actually place themselves. And so using the log linear regression, we did find that there is a highly significant relationship between those two. I tried with connectivity as well, but it doesn't really work with connectivity. Um, but what we find is that generally most of them have a similar trend, and then you look at the position four, so that's where they tie two uh, branches together, two trees together, that they're just using whatever they can. Um, it's a sort of very even spread of any of the sort of shapes available. Uh, crown volume, we'll just skip over that because it's long. Canopy density with photos. Uh, yeah, so they are basically just choosing the higher canopy densities, and it's a much more noticeable one uh, between in the reforested site. Same with gap density, they're avoiding the highest gaps. Uh, again, it's is much, much, much more noticeable in the reforested site than what is in the pristine. Um, I work with a guy with ground based LIDAR. This is kind of complicated. Basically, it's just looking at uh, rugosity, which is the standard deviation of the mean outer canopy height. Um, and basically, they're sort of preferring the higher rugosity, so it's more unusual shape, uh, sort of more movement. And yeah, conclusions, which is what I sort of said. I've gone really over, sorry. That's the thing. And thanks uh, for everyone that have helped me with this. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, have, you changed, have you considered uh, detectability might be different in the different canopy characteristics at all? Sorry, I can't hear very well. Have you thought about the detectability of nests might be a bit different in the different That's canopies? That's the thing, so yeah. Um, the general sort of dish, I think the distance that we're finding most in that is developing up to 20 meters in Sydney, but further than I should report one in the reforestation site, which is 38 meters. It's just that it's because reforestation is so much more open, there's huge gaps between the trees, you are able to notice them a lot. But is, it, is it possible then that the magnitude of your effects are actually yeah. larger? Yeah, that's the thing I need to also um, I need to actually do when I try to do uh, electricity to work out the actual density of your own accounts, and it probably will find a much lower density um, for both OIC, which is maybe easier to spot them. Thanks, John. Our next speaker is Emma Goldberg, who's going to talk about the effects of an outbreak of ash dieback. Uh, Monks with National Nature Thank you. Um, so, yeah, moving from Borneo to Cambridgeshire, 
Um, the um, purpose of the talk, really, I was happy to hear in the um, Mike Begon's plenary session uh, in his definitions of ecology that, uh, that ecology has been a, a very um, pure descriptive science and now it's running parallel with a crisis ecology of meeting uh, the challenges of today. And I realized happily that my talk is that sweet spot between the two. Um, so I, uh, I'm not talking about a wood that um, has visible impact yet of ash dieback, although it was recorded for the first time last year. Um, but uh, looking at the structure and ecology of monkswood as a baseline preparation uh, so that we can better understand the impact of ash dieback as it occurs. Uh, so ash dieback uh, was recorded um, or reported uh, in the UK first in 2011, and this map shows from 2012 to 2016 uh, the new, new sightings um, uh, it's not an intensity map, it's just each time a new sighting is recorded. Um, I suspect that the amount of recording, the amount of uh, desire to record new sites has decreased because I certainly haven't been to a wood this year uh, where I haven't seen ash die back. Uh, although I usually ask the a person who's invited me to the wood, have you got ash die back? And they say, no, I haven't. And about five minutes later, I say, yes, you have. Um, so it may also be a possibility of through not, not recognizing it. Um, uh, so uh, Monkswood has shown uh, an, an arrow in Cambridgeshire. Uh, so the, it, it's um, been in a, uh, we, 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 it wasn't a surprise uh, that it got ash die back. Uh, and um, it's a reserve that's managed by Natural England. Um, and is currently, it has been coppice woodland and is currently uh, predominantly minimum intervention. So in order to see what sort of data was available for a baseline survey, uh, we, uh, uh, Mungswood is a site that has been very well studied uh, for a lot of different species and taxa. Um, uh, but it did emerge that a lot of the studies mainly focused either on a specific species or on ground flora, and there wasn't a lot of data about the structure of the wood. Uh, however, in 1966, Dick Steele um, recorded plots um, in Monk's Wood, and um, here is a, a plea that you may have heard from long-term studies before to always write down your methodology. It makes it a lot simpler for people who are repeating it. Um, uh, so um, we believe that there were 36 circular plots, uh, that we think that they were um, of an 11.24 meter radius, and that we thought that all trees and shrubs over five centimeters dBH were recorded, uh, and that the ground floor was measured in one of two different methods, uh, which was not recorded. Uh, so, uh, so that was interesting. Uh, so. Um, uh, an MSc student um, wanted to resurvey, and they did that in 1996. And they, uh, oh, that's uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I've got a map on my next, uh, which you can have a look at in a minute. Uh, so they resurveyed, uh, and they resurveyed all the trees and shrubs, uh, which were all measured, uh, and they did a subset of um, eight ground flora species of the most dominant uh, through the wood at that time. And uh, Keith and I re-recorded all 36 plots this year. Uh, we looked again at all the tree and shrubs over five centimetres, and we recorded the ground methodology to the same uh, methodology as the 1996 uh, survey did, um, but we uh, recorded all ground flora species so that we could compare both with the 1996 and with the 1966 data. Uh, so here's a, um, a map showing the plots that were done in 19. Uh, uh, in 1996, as far as we know from the descriptions, we know that they didn't uh, record on rides and they didn't record in the open fields that are in the plot. And there's an air photograph, and I don't know how clearly the contrast is, but the blue dots on it are GPS located dots where we recorded, uh, which we thought were pretty good. Um, they don't look exactly the same as the black and white ones, but so. Uh, we can say that our um, um, baseline data ha is, a, is a descriptive um, uh, com comparison between the, two, uh, the three records. And what did we find in terms of trees? 
the tree composition, uh, this graph shows the percentage stems uh, from the three plots, and we can see that ash has a dominance uh, that is more or less consistent, uh, about uh, 55, 56, 57%, uh, and that other species were um, uh, all more minor, but particularly with uh, field maple, Acer campestre, uh, Betula pendula in uh, 1996 has declined. Um, but uh, interestingly, the um, almost the elm, which uh, has been showing consistent signs of ash dieback, is uh, uh, still regenerating and dying back, um, and uh, is, has a number of a large number of stems at the current time. Um, so, in age distribution of the wood, uh, it's looking something like this. Uh, the chart on the left showing the age dis distribution across all tree species and uh, a nice um, small increment um, between um, 1996 and 2016. Uh, and I just put up the ash uh, as it's the focal point of uh, my thinking um, uh, as a comparison. And, um, uh, I don't know, um, I'm over familiar with ash dieback at the moment, I've been thinking about it for at least four years, um, but uh, ash dieback does tend to hit the younger um, cohort of trees first uh, because it causes a, a ring barking around the, the tree which they can't survive. Um, so um, the majority of the stems being in the lower age uh, may, may be significant uh, for, the, for the wood. Um, and frequently the, the more mature trees just die of something else, so, uh, that, such as a honey fungus attack subsequently. So it's not, not necessarily rosy for them, but um, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, looking at the shrub species um, coverage by plot, um, uh, uh, interesting um, uh, that hazel uh, and hawthorn, Cratiagus uh, monogyna and Corolla savalana are, are the major um, dominant sh shrub species with a, a, a bit of Pruna spinosa and several others which are listed along the bottom there, uh, Cornus sanguineus, Euonymus uh, europaeus, Malus sylvestris, Salix species, Sambucus nigra are all uh, low level um, through the wood. And so far, so good, uh, a good, uh, reasonable shrub layer. Uh, however, uh, with initially thinking, you know, not much change there. Uh, however, uh, when we plotted the total number of stems, we saw a slightly interesting story emerging um, that uh, we weren't necessarily expecting that, uh, in fact, the uh, Hawthorn Cratiagus monogyna uh, decreasing in... in um, DBH uh, with the hazel increasing um, in that time space. Um, so ground flora um, uh, <laughs> is, is another uh, slight anomalous uh, finding that uh, in 1966, they recorded a total of 24 species with a mean of 4.8 species per plot. Um, and in 2016, we recorded 55 species uh, with a mean of 12 uh, per plot. Um, the low number of species may have been to do with a denser bramble cover and uh, that, a photograph from 1987, uh, probably at the beginning of the increasing and budgeting Munt Jack deer population in Monk's Woods that um, uh, significantly changed the ground flora. Um, uh, but it also was quite likely, in fact, that... Um, while we'd assumed that Dick Steel, the Dick Steele survey had um, done five uh, two by two meter plots for each, uh, uh, quadrats for each plot, they may have actually only recorded one, uh, which would <laughs> explain significantly the difference between the two plots. Uh, we are going to go back and look at the data because we'll and, uh, compare the uh, average per two by two meter plot instead of across the whole plot. Uh, but haven't done that yet. Um, and the frequency uh, uh, comparing all three data sets using the, uh, the eight most common species in 1996 and now uh, shows uh, an interesting story again, uh, not unexpected because we have understood for some time that the deer population rose significantly in the late 80s and 90s uh, and control started uh, in the beginning of the turn of the millennium um, uh, but it did lead to a, a, a 
predominance of, uh, of, of, uh, non -vas of uh, grasses and sedges uh, in the canopy um, uh, and, a, and a severe decrease of um, the dog's mercury, mercurial mercurialis perennis, um, but uh, still nicely illustrated in the bar chart. Uh, we, we did a little more examination of the differences between 1966 and 2016 and tried to uh, classify groups. And uh, I should explain here that the darker shade uh, is the groups of species that we had five or more occurrences across the plots, and the pale one is the ones that had fewer than five records, uh, just a, as an amalgamated um, um, uh, system. Uh, so. Um, uh, yeah, uh, again, we see that the, um, the grasses and rushes have massively increased. Uh, so um, the frequency per, um, per plot over here and the total number of occurrences uh, on, the, on the right there uh, and showing that the grasses and rushes are really shooting up in the, in the later um, recording period. Uh, so I thought I'd also show you um, a little bit visually how the wood looked uh, then and now, and we didn't have many photographs from uh, 1966, but um, these two pictures were from uh, around that time. We don't think they were related to the actual survey, but you can see on the left um, a recent coppice plot. And uh, yeah, the, um, the lighting in here doesn't do my slides particular favours. It is slightly faded, but the ground flora is actually a rather beautiful um, uh, bluebell and primrose carpet, uh, the likes of which you could not wish for better in spring. Uh, the one on the right showing a, a more overgrown um, coppice rotation later on in the rotation. Um, and then quickly some pictures from uh, the current time. Um, uh, I tried to illustrate some of the variation in the ground flora, so we're, we're not totally devoid of bramble uh, in the top right, uh, a little bit of over, overstood hazel, uh, which would be was probably over, beyond the rotation period now, uh, some blackthorn and uh, a bit of sedge uh, dominance in that slide there. But it, ha it would be fair to say, I think, that the most of the um, quadrats that we recorded were a sea of Brachypodium sylvaticum, um, and again, very strongly linked to the um, long impact of Munchak deer. Um, so, what does it all mean? What are the implications for ash dieback? Um, so, currently, the rides are mown, but otherwise, the wood is predominantly in minimum intervention, with uh, some, maybe a third of it uh, that is deer fenced, uh, and the rest of it is still open. Uh, deer management is taking place across the, across the wood. Um, we saw that there's over 50% of the wood is, is, um, is currently occupied by ash, but other species, particularly the minor species, field maple, birch, and aspen, uh, and the shrub species, look to become uh, the scene of the future. Um, elm is likely to continue, although um, will be limited by Dutch elm disease. Um, we, we don't know yet uh, whether the canopy gaps would be sufficient to allow uh, regeneration of oak or indeed whether the munchak uh, are under low enough populations to allow uh, regeneration of oak. Um, the open canopy may favour the grassy species and let them persist, but if we get the dense thicket, uh, that's likely to, sh to possibly shade some of the grasses out. It will depend on continued deer control um, and regeneration of ash to favour any resistance of the pathogen is going to be really important. Uh, so just to wrap up, uh, we hope that these combined surveys provide a good description of the wood. There are already changes which we can explain in management and in deer impact. Ash is likely to decline significantly, and really importantly, all layers need to be considered when uh, doing vegetation monitoring uh, to look at the ash. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. Time for one quick question. Hey, next up is Jenny Dunn, who's going to talk about diet of a rapidly declining bird in relation to habitat provision. Okay, thanks, David. 
Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, some work that I've been involved with since 2010, um, looking at habitat provision for turtle doves, and more recently looking at some dietary analysis to find out whether they're actually eating what we're providing for them. So to give you a little bit of background, um, the European turtle dove is a long-distance migrant. It uh, breeds throughout Europe and Asia, and it winters in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's ecologically unique within the UK in that it is our only migrant uh, obligate granivore. So it relies on seed food year round. And we're lucky with this species in that we've had two previous quite detailed autoecological studies. One in the 1960s when the population was stable and one in the 1990s when the population was already in quite steep decline. And there are two key messages to take from these two studies. The first is that in the 1960s the, uh, the species was having up to four brood breeding attempts per year whereas in the 1990s it's having one, maybe two, breeding attempts per year. So we've got this decline in reproductive effort, and this is co strongly correlated with a, with a switch in diet from these semi-natural um, species, so fumitory and common chickweed here, which uh, used to be typically widespread in arable land, to um, more cultivated crops, such as all-seed rape and wheat, that were commonly found um, in spill as, as spillages in farmyards. So... The turtle dove is of particular concern because the population is pretty much falling off a cliff. Um, so it's our, our fastest declining breeding bird in the UK. We've lost 97% of um, UK turtle doves since the 1970s. Um, and this pattern is similar across Europe. So we've also got a very strong decline across Europe. So in 2010, we started some work looking at how we could potentially manipulate this habitat um, to provide for, uh, food for breeding turtle doves in the UK. So we provided um, trial plots. So we trialled um, a seed mix that we rolled out across six farms in East Anglia. Um, so our experimental layout was um, it focused on a one kilometre square within which we knew there were at least two turtle dove territories denoted by these blue dots. And then we had a total of two hectares of this trial plot mix sown in either, uh, either farm edges or filled corners. So we had six um, trial plot farms and six control farms. And we monitored these between 2011 um, and, and 2014, so we had four trial years. And the seed mix within these plots was designed to encompass plants that were known to be formally important in the diet of this species. So we had fumitory, um, black medic, common vetch, clover species, and um, either common mouse ear or um, birds for trefoil, so we tweaked the mix slightly after two years. And the idea was that we'd create this patchy open structure so you've got high-density seed provision, but you've also got these open areas where the birds can land and access the seed. So in addition to the habitat manipulation, uh, we, did, we um, attached radio tags to birds so that we can monitor their habitat use. We found nests so that we could assess per nest productivity. And more recently, we've also been doing some dietary analysis using next-generation sequencing of faecal samples so that we can tell what the birds are actually eating. And the, idea of the, the overall idea of the project is that we can... Um, look at all these data together to work out how we can positively influence turtle dove numbers. So briefly, I'm, I'm going to start by talking about the response to the habitat manipulation. So this is looking at the population scale, it's looking at the whole farm scale, and looking at the number of territories, um, number of territorial male turtle doves per year on each farm. So um, we've got this marginally significant effect um, so we certainly haven't got a, a positive effect on population trends. Populations are still declining very quickly. Um, but we've got this suggestion that um, trial plot for, on trial plot farms, turtle dove numbers are declining more slowly. So it's not a particularly convincing effect. So what we actually want to ask is, this habitat manipulation is intended to provide food for the bird. So are they actually eating? D does the diet actually relate to the habitat manipulation that we're providing? So... This is a horribly complex graph. I will point out the important parts of it. So these are the um, results of um, the components of uh, faecal samples from adult birds, nestling birds, and samples collected from nests post-fledging. So the important things that you need to know here, don't worry about reading any of this at the bottom. Um, each of these is a plant species that's found either in um, turtle dove diet or in plots. And these are color coded according to whether they're common in trial plots, those in blue, those in black are those that are occasionally present in trial plots, but not reliably. And those species in red are those that are never found in trial plots. And then if you look, each species has a bar above it, and the amount of black within each bar is the proportion of turtle dove diets within which that species is found. 
So what we're interested in here is these thick black bars because these are the species that are important in turtle dove diet. So statistical analysis suggested that there are 10 key species in here. So we've got five species that are found in these trial plots. I should also mention, I should mention at this point that none of these species are actually sown components of the plots. So none of these are actually spe species that we set out to have in the trial plots. These are species that have um, come in because they're generally widespread in the um, environment. And we've also got the remaining five species of importance in diet are those that are never found in trial plots. So what and where are these birds actually eating? So these are the ten um, species of importance. We've got these three cultivated species here. So I mentioned before that the previous study had shown that wheat and brassica um, were important for turtle doves. That seems to still be the case. And there's quite a lot of borage within our study area. So it seems that they're using that as well. We've got these four um, relatively common and still widespread um, species that are uh, arable plants. Um, so they are still feeding in some semi-natural. But we've also got these three species at the top, which hadn't previously been recorded in the UK. And when I first um, had this result, I was intrigued, and um, this was the impression I had. Um, luckily, I think this is a false impression. Um, but these three species are commonly found in um, bird seed mixes that are fed um, in gardens. So the question is, are turtle doves actually, is there any evidence that turtle doves are showing an increased use in gardens, have they found this alternative food supply that's much more predictable and much easier to find than the historic um, food supply? So we've got two long-term data sets in the UK. We've got the uh, Breeding Bird Survey and we've got the Garden Bird Watch, um, both run by the BTO. So if we compare the recording rate of turtle doves in these two surveys, um, you see the recording rate from the Breed Breeding Bird Survey declines rapidly over time. and this is um, this um, yeah, rep is representative of the um, population decline. But if you look at the recording rate in gardens, so this rate does decline slightly, but it does suggest that an increasing proportion of the ever-declining population is actually being reported um, within gardens. So what do we know about the consequences of this um, apparent increased use of gardens? So. We looked at the proportion of turtle dove diet that consisted of um, components that were found in gardens, and we looked at associations um, with adult and nestling body condition. And we found positive associations in both adults and nestlings. So the higher, proportion, the higher the proportion of fed dietary components in their diet, the better the body condition of both adults and nestlings. And if we look at um, this another way, so for each of the nests that we monitored, um, we measured the chicks, we weighed the chicks at seven days old, and um, when we relate the mass of chicks at seven days old to the distance from hum of the nest from human habitation as a surrogate for food provisioning, we find this really strong relationship. So the if you're a turtle dove, the closer you nest to human habitation, the heavier your chicks are going to be at seven days old. And we also know from some um, radio taken work of nestlings and fledglings that the heavier you are at seven days old, the more likely you are um, to still be alive after 30 days. So we've got this strong association with post-fledging survival. So it seems as though turtle doves might have changed their ecology to, to um, increase the proportion of food that they're taking from gardens. And this seems to have a positive effect on chicks. But we have also got this risk of, of increased, um, increased exposure to parasites. So wherever you've got birds coming in to feed in high densities, you've got this risk of increased disease transmission. And the parasite that we're particularly concerned about in turtle doves is the Trichomonas gallinae parasite. So this is um, the parasite that's responsible for the rapid decline in greenfinch populations in the UK over the past 10 years. And we know um, from previous work um, carried out by Jen Stockdale that this parasite can cause mortality in turtle doves in both adults and nestlings. And we also know in a farmland environment um, from some work done by Rosie Lennon, that where you've got farms that provide supplementary food for game birds year-round, um, your columbid population as a whole is more likely to, is, has a higher prevalence of this parasite. So it's likely that this mechanism is also occurring in gardens. So where you've got more birds coming in to feed, you've got this increased risk of parasite transmission. So um, a PhD student based at the University of Leeds, Rebecca Thomas, has been screening farmland environments and screening various shared food and water resources 
to see whether or not this is the case, um, to see whether or not these shared resources have a higher prevalence of trichomonas and therefore a higher risk of um, disease transmission. And sure enough, if you look, um, so she sampled bait pearls, water sources and game bird feeders, and also as a control, these trial plots. And you can see that, given that she's going out and swabbing a metre of ground, I was extremely surprised at the, this high prevalence that she was finding. Um, but where you've got these shared water resources, you do have this increased risk of parasite transmission. So, to summarise, so we've tried to provide these trial plots that will get turtle doves feeding at low densities back out in the agricultural environment, but they don't seem to be using them. We've got this really poor overlap between what the turtle doves are actually eating and the species that we're actually providing for them. But we do have this um, increased uh, this association between um, this increased use of garden of components of garden bird seed mixes. And we do also have these positive associations between these dietary components, adult condition and chick mass. And we know that, uh, that an increased chick mass increases post-fledging survival. But we do have this increased risk of parasite transmission. So ultimately, we do actually still need to come up with this uh, way of provisioning food better um, in the farmland landscape so that we can reduce this parasite transmission risk while still providing this resource. And the final point that I just want to make is that um, faecal analysis using next generation sequencing provides a really, really useful tool for a non-invasive method of monitoring habitat use in relation to habitat provision and potentially tweaking um, agro-environments options such as this. So I'd like to thank, um, there's a huge fieldwork team that have been involved in this project over the years. Um, I've got some great collaborators at Leeds who've been involved with the trichomonas work. Um, we're funded by RSPB Natural England, and we've also had some funding for the molecular work from MBAF at Sheffield. Um, and I'd just like to finish by um, plugging a PhD that we're currently advertising based at Cardiff. Um, so um, if you've got any really good master's <coughs> students or finally a project students, who would be interested in doing fieldwork in a wide range of countries, as uh, indicated over here, um, then please do put them in touch with me. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, time for some questions. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Um, so the, you, you mentioned this briefly, but the food items that they appear to be taking from the garden, yeah. what's the potential for providing those more widely, for example, on the trial plots? Yeah, so we are, so we are actually trialling um, at the moment, so we're a bit nervous about um, saying to farmers, oh, provide supplementary feed for the birds because we know of this increased parasite risk. So we are actually trialling methods at the moment of providing supplementary food at low densities. Um, and early results of that do suggest that you can provide um, supplementary food at a low density over a wide area and you reduce your parasite transmission risk. So hopefully that is something that we may be able to advocate in the future. Um, but we're not at a stage to do so at the moment. Is insufficient, oh, thank you. Is insufficient food the, the main factor that's driving the decline of this species? So um, the work that was done in 1990 suggested that this reduction in reproductive effort was sufficient to explain the population decline in the UK. Um, we do now know that there are other factors coming into play, so obviously it's a migratory species, um, there's habitat change in the Sahel in, in Africa, and there's also hunting and migration. Um, so these are factors that we are looking into, but we do have historic evidence that the breeding conditions are extremely important for the species. Okay, so uh, next up is Peter Lawrence, who's going to talk about uh, managed realignment of salt marshes. Yes, uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to try and keep it quite light today. Uh, basically, I'm going to be talking about the role of topography in managed realignment schemes. So first of all, I suppose I sh we should ask the question, why should we care about uh, salt marshes, uh, particularly in the UK? Well, first of all, most of us li live fairly close to the coast, and as a result, it's fairly important that we value our coastal ecosystems correctly. 
And uh, over the last few years, we've, we can actually see that actually uh, in, in Britain in particular, uh, this, uh, salt marshes actually provide a lot of ecosystem services, and many of them extremely valuable to local communities. But it's not just that they're valuable, uh, they're also uh, at risk from a whole variety of forces. To probably the two most common of these is sea level rise and uh, human activities. With the lack of movement, movement of sea walls, because they're obviously static, and the increase of sea level rise, we get confinement of uh, salt marshes into ever smaller packages, eventually leading to their loss. And also human activities such as pollution and land claim for port construction, for example, uh, resort in the, in the direct loss of salt marsh. And these aren't trivial losses at all. I and mean, here's an example of some slumping going on here uh, due to eutrophication of waterways. And here's an example of what happens when you don't have anything to attenuate wave energy striking your sea walls. Quite serious costs. But it's also not just the risk. We don't actually have much salt marsh to give away anyway. Um, so in the UK, I've got uh, two systems here, peatlands and ancient woodlands. We can see you know, they are, they're still fairly rare. We actually put salt marsh aerial extent on there. And all of a sudden, we realize that salt marshes are both rare, they're at risk of loss, and they're also extremely valuable. So we kind of need to do something about it. Um, well, the British government uh, quite gladly uh, came up with a figure of needing to create 140 hectares per year to compensate for former losses and to compensate for future losses. Now, how do they do this? Well, what the, main, the main method of creating salt marsh is through a process called managed realignment, which quite simply is the breaching of former sea defences allowing the land to flood and building cheaper, easier to maintain sea defences further inland. And I've plotted here 140 hectares per year as a, as a diagonal blue line, and actually the area created through managed realignment underneath in the, with the orange circles. And we're falling a little bit short of that target so far. But there's also a second target. Salt marshes shouldn't just be created haphazardly. Uh, they also need to be created with the, with the guideline of being uh, biologically equivalent which essentially means uh, with similar biological composition. So in a paper published in 2012 by Mossman et al, uh, we've got an example here of uh, both relatively new managed realignment schemes between zero and 25 years old, and some examples of some uh, realignments that have actually happened by accident by, due to flooding in the yellow graph. And what we're looking at here is a disparity from the zero line. The zero line is essentially our baseline of a natural salt marsh if we just look at these species here in particular, we can see that on either time scale, these, these bars diverge from the zero baseline, quite significantly so, uh, essentially meaning you don't have the same communities there. Um, but I also find this result here quite interesting as well. There's actually more bare earth. I mean, considering we're trying to create a salt marsh, you kind of want plants there. So the, the high proportion of bare earth in particular, I think sort of gives us credence to say that we're probably not creating them uh, with the same biological uh, characteristics. But we obviously want to create those biological characteristics. So how do we go about doing this? Well, elevation is the primary driver of what soil marsh plants arrive at certain locations. So let's have a look at that. So in this photo here, we can actually see most of a salt marsh uh, zonation happening. So we can see the mud flats out at the end, the pioneer species with interspaced bits of bare earth at this slightly lower end, the mid marsh with lots of flowering plants, which is very diverse at this elevation range, and then finally our upper marsh plants, and that transition to a terrestrial ecosystem. And this sort of pattern happens all over the, the country. And it's backed up by Davy and co authors in 2011, who did actually show, show that these, these species up here on the right hand side clearly have individual sort of packets of elevation that they like to, like to exist in. I just saw exactly. Uh, highlighted about 50% of the elevation range there on the right-hand side. I can see that really there's only the Salicornia and Puxinellia that occur with any real uh, credence at that sort of elevation range. So we know elevation is really important, but is it the full picture? Well, I don't believe so. So what I've done here is I've created two hypothetical surfaces, both with the same range of elevations, but one with a subtly different topography. So let's put a bit of context on there. So let's put some plants on there. So the low, plant, the low plants like it low, the high plants like it high. But how about these sorts of manipulations or diversions from a flat surface? 
Well, I've characterised these as phrases such as locally low and locally high. And what you see in these areas, you either get unique species that like a particularly wet environment at a high elevation, or a surprisingly dry uh, conditions at a low elevation. So it's, it's far more complex than just elevation alone. So how do we detect topography? So we're starting to suggest that this might be an important factor. Well, elevation is quite easy to detect. You take a GPS, you take a spot measurement of your elevation, usually with something high precision, like a differential GPS. Topography is almost the exact same thing. However, you take into context its local surroundings. So, for example, we, we heard about rugosity in an earlier talk. Rugosity is essentially a measure of the standard deviation of a block of cells around a central point, uh, getting a measure of rugosity in that sense. So I wanted to investigate this. I investigated this uh, as a difference between managed realignments and natural marshes, predominantly. So to do so, I took 20 managed realignments from around the British coastline, delineating them on through a package on uh, ArcGIS, basically drawing round one. Here's an example of a site in Essex called Tolsbury. And then I took the average shoreline extent of these managed realignments from around the British coastline and used that as a guide to then uh, draw, my, draw around my natural salt marshes fairly close by, ensuring that they were roughly the same, uh, same size, essentially, because some of these natural marshes extend for many kilometres either side of a managed realignment. And I also took a, a reference of a local agricultural field fairly nearby as well. So I sampled that randomly at roughly 10% density and resulted in nearly three quarters of a million observations of either topography, elevation, distance to nearest creeks, and many other ways that we might quantify a topographic surface. So what do the results from this look like so far? Well, encouragingly for land managers and people who create these managed realignment sites, the actual range of elevations created, so effectively are you creating them with a high a high, high and a low low, are about the same, uh, so certainly uh, mathematically so. Uh, they're not significantly different. There is a lot of variation in how much a creek network dissects a site and, and how close any individual point is to a creek. Um, but even still, mathematically, we can say they're not significantly different, which is really encouraging on a landscape scale for uh, managed realignment schemes. But what we really wanted to talk about was that local scale uh, characteristics. Well, managed realignment schemes sorry, on a local scale are almost certainly flatter. So I use two different uh, metrices here of rugosity or, uh, or ruggedness, uh, which is essentially the 3D unpred unpredictability of a surface on a 3 by 3 meter scale. And in, with using both of these uh, measures, we can see that the managed realignment is, is pretty significantly less rugged than a natural site. But it doesn't end there. The actual story carries on. They're also far wetter. So the topographic wetness index, for people who aren't too sure about what that is, it's essentially a measure of an individual location's ability to drain water through it to the next lowest cell surrounding it. And a high value here essentially means you are wet. And a low value means you're relatively dry. So in these results, again, we see a significant difference between our managed realignment and natural salt marshes, suggesting that the managed realignments are probably wetter or uh, suffer with uh, a lower ability to drain. <clears throat> the final uh, measure I chose to, chose to take was the either a concave or so it's a curvature matrix, which here is re represented by the dashed line on the right-hand side. Zero meaning perfectly flat, a positive score meaning relatively concave, so essentially a depression, and a, a negative score actually meaning convex, so essentially a small hillock. So we see a, a complete shift here between managed realignments and natural salt marshes in which we'll probably, if, if at any given moment on a, natural, uh, on a managed realignment, we would see that we'd probably stood in some sort of trough, whereas on a managed realignment, the odds are you probably stood on some sort of hill. So these are, these are quite fundamental differences for the creation of a, of, of a topographic surface and for the niche provision of the plants that we're interested in creating. So one of the, uh, one of the criticisms sometimes rounded upon scientists 
who are analyzing these differences between uh, systems that take a long time to develop is that you're not giving them enough time or, oh, we're still trialing this method. Perhaps we need to go onto a bigger scale. Well, I took the, I took the 12 uh, managed realignments uh, out of the, um, for the analysis and actually looked at them in comparison to how long they had been created or how big they were. And in fact, against all the metrices that I used for, topo uh, for topography, they had incredibly weak correlations and none of them significantly um, uh, significant. So I don't think we can say that giving them time would be sufficient. <coughs> so indeed, I think the implications for coastal conservation and probably a salt marsh restoration in particular is that managed realignment age and size is no guarantee of developing a similar topography and thus the, the provision for certain plant species. But also, they're probably locally too flat, which we can possibly uh, rectify with uh, some more creative topography. <coughs> and they almost certainly don't drain as well and have too many concave features amongst them. So this also could be rectified potentially with the use of more hills rather than pans or scrapes that um, encourage birds and waders. So I've taken a photo here from Steart in Somerset, a very, very new managed realignment. And in the center there, you can see a small yellow island. This is an example of one of the, one of, one of the first times I've seen of uh, hills deliberately being built to try and create the provision for, more, for more, plants, more plant species. And you can see, in comparison to its neighbors, even though it's very early days, there's far more vegetation around it than it's in its neighboring sites. Uh, so I just wanted to thank everybody, including our chair today at this site, um, for coming and for my supervisor, Hannah Mossman, and my university for funding me. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. It's very kind of you. <laughs> uh, we've got time for some questions. Uh, right, th thank you very much. It's interesting. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about the realignments being wetter and part of it being concave. Is there any thoughts that possibly the substrate is, is different in some way depending on what the previous use was? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, so this, I mean, this, this piece of work in particular was, was focusing on the actual surface topography itself. Um, so when I say it's wetter, what I actually mean is that the surface uh, suffers with a, a lack of an ability to drain its water. Um, at one of these sites, actually stay at the final site that I showed you, I'm actually doing some work there separate to this, uh, in this standalone piece of work to look very much at that question. Is, is the soil chemistry and, uh, and depth profile, depending on land uses, different? And does that then affect what plants develop? Um, I think the early results from that piece of work that I've not sort of um, presented today, beginning to show that the actual former land use itself it probably isn't as important as, for example, the amount of accretion that's developing there. Uh, if, you, if you develop, for example, um, one of, um, in, this, in the site against Steart, there's areas that near, with nearly a metre of accretion of, of sediment there, which is almost entirely marine sediment. And those, that's the environment that the plants need to colonise then. So it's, it, it sort of negates the, the importance of the former land use there. But it may be influencing sort of ground water flows and... Uh, uh, through um, so the water can't travel as far down and then across the um, across the aquaclude. Thank you. Time for one more question. Well, I have one. Uh, you mentioned the government target to uh, to recreate 140 hectares per year. Mm. Um, I mean, to me, that seems an incredibly modest target, but we're still failing to hit that. Yep. But what do you think of the, the target? And, why aren't we making that uh, one of the probably one of the main reasons for uh, not quite reaching that target is that it's not as simple as um, uh, as I sort of made out in the first place that my realignments are just breaching former sea walls. Quite often, you've, the the government has to deal with a lot of different land managers uh, or a lot of different owners of land and get the permissions for for the flooding to occur. Um, and it's not just that, uh, people also uh, get very upset about, and rightfully so, about things like food security 
uh, there's potato like potato fields. Managed realignments tend to happen on grade one agricultural land, and uh, it's something that people find very hard to let go of. And it's really important that um, sort of we engage with the public when making these decisions about where we where we take part in these 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 schemes. It's probably slowing the process a great deal. Thank <laughs> you.